go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming tonight. This is the No Fail Observation Visit webinar. So it's part three of our accreditation series, which rotates every two months. Um, I'm glad you've taken the time to join us and I hope this webinar can um, help answer some of your questions or calm some of the nerves that you might have about your accreditation visit. Um, and let's see, oh, if at any point during the webinar, um, you have questions, feel free to go ahead and type them in that same question box um, and I will get to them as I go and as time allows. Okay, so I will briefly go over what we will cover. Um, so to get started, other than the day you receive your award, the day of your observation visit is kind of your highlight of accreditation. So you've worked hard to implement the standards, um, to work with the children on that relationship-based, um, those relationship-based standards, and you plan for a day that runs smoothly. And so we just want to share plenty of information with you so that you feel completely prepared and you're not surprised on the day of your visit. Um, and you'll know how to have that no-fail observation day. Um, so to reach that goal, we're going to briefly review the accreditation process as a whole. We'll do that. Um, in each of our accreditation webinars um, that we have uh, going over the two month series so that you can kind of remind yourself every time. And then we'll then cover how you prepare for the observation visit. We'll talk about the provider packet that we mail out to you. Um, and then some of your expectations you can have for the day of and what happens after the observer leaves your home. Okay. So as I mentioned, we'll first start with a brief review of the whole accreditation process so you can see where the observation visit lies and how it will help you along the accreditation path. So as you can see on here, we talk about accreditation as a continuum of quality. Um, it's designed to support your efforts in that continued professional development and quality improvement so that you're being accredited provider um, rather than just getting accredited, getting the certificate and being done with it. It's an ongoing process. Um, so the steps first include self-study enrollment. So during self-study, um, providers evaluate themselves and their programs using the NAFCC quality standards. And then they make those quality improvements and gather the required documentation and training hours so that they'll be ready to start in their application. At the application, um, phase. Candidates um, feel they've reached their professional development goals, they're ready to make, um, or they've made those quality improvements and they're ready to have the visit. And so they submit the application and commit to completing the whole observation and scoring process at this time. Um, during the observation piece, which is what we'll cover in depth today, the NAFCC trained observer conducts the on-site observation of your program and you. Um, they'll gather information based on the quality standards and objectively document what they've observed. After that, we'll review their documentation and everything you have sent us, as well as data from the parent surveys, and we'll use that information to determine your accreditation status. So at this point, if you've passed the observation phase, um, we'll award the accreditation, and the accreditation is awarded for a period of three years. The next piece of the accreditation process is the update. So the update offers a way for accredited providers to update NAFCC about their programs during their three-year accreditation period. Um, you'll just verify that you continue to meet those eligibility requirements and then you'll submit a report regarding your professional development and quality improvement activities that you've done um, throughout the year. Um, if you do turn in the update, you don't have to start again in self-study, but if you do um, miss turning in that update, you may have to re-enroll in self-study in order to submit the application again. And then the next step is re-accreditation. So um, family child care providers display that ongoing commitment to the profession of family child care when they are pursuing reaccreditation. So that means before they expire, they reapply so they can have another visit um, and be accredited for another period of three years. So it's the same vetting process um, and we review all the same documentation and everything. Um, so accredited providers who maintain their accreditation status as long as they are actively involved um, in providing family child care um, just shows 
you know, their communities and, and, um, and us as well, but family childcare is that legitimate childcare option and it, that it's essential for those communities. Um, if you have questions about these individual steps, I know that's a lot of information, you can go ahead and visit our website. So the best place to go is nafcc.org slash achieving and maintaining accreditation, um, or you can learn more through this webinar series. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I do, I will just copy over the links that I just told you, if I can get to them. Okay, sorry about that. I'm just copying over those links into the chat. Um, and right now, if you have any questions, please just type that into the chat and I'll take a look there and let me know. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'll go ahead and move on. Okay, um, so let's jump into all things observation, which is why you came tonight. Um, if you haven't already submitted your application, the first question will, you'll want to ask yourself is when you should submit. So first, before submitting, be sure that you do feel ready. So make sure you go over the quality standards again, whether you're in self-study or re-accreditation, make sure you feel comfortable with them and that you're implementing all of them before submitting the application. Um, and when you submit the application, that tells us that you're ready for an observer to come out to you. Um, first time candidates and reaccrediting providers should submit the application according to the month that you want your visit to take place. Um, so it's important that you plan the submission of, of your application based on the best time to have your visit. So what I have up on the slide um, is the timeline that we go off of. Um, so for example, if you uh, don't want to visit in the summertime because your enrollment kind of changes or goes down, um, you probably want to be careful about submitting an application in March, April, or May. Um, since that might, that would mean your visit was in June, July, or August. Um, and then another example is if you do know what month you want to have your visit take place, you can go off of that and say, if I want to visit in October, I know that I have to submit by July. We do suggest for those re-accrediting providers that we have here with us to make sure that you plan to have your observation visit before your accreditation expiration date. So as I talked about before, um, your accreditation is valid for three years. And so sometimes providers will use that end date as the day they need to submit their application. However, then they might have problems with state funding or their QRIS because their accreditation is technically expired um, since they had to wait that about two or three months to get their observation visit. Um, so you are aware we can't, get, or we can't extend your accreditation beyond that three year end date. So if you do wanna maintain that same date, you'll wanna submit ahead of time. We usually recommend five or six months just to be safe. Um, so for example, if you, your accreditation expires in July of 2020, you wouldn't wanna submit any later than February to avoid losing your accreditation. Okay. So as we mentioned previously, as long as you submit a complete application, you can feel sure that your observation month will be on one of those months that we listed on the chart and that's on our website as well. You can always call us if you're not sure. Um, once your application's been reviewed and determined to be complete, a member of our team will either call or email you and will ask you which of those two months you prefer to have the visit. So at that point, they will also ask you to pick four exclusion dates. Um, after we've heard back with you about your month and exclusion dates, one of our team members will reach out to you, or sorry, to an observer to coordinate with them to schedule your visit. Um, and then regarding those exclusion dates, those are the dates that um, we will not come and visit, but um, 
all the other days will be considered el eligible days for the visit. Um, and you will not know the specific date of your visit. You will just know that it won't be on any of those exclusion dates or if it's a federal holiday, we'll exclude those as well. So you might be asking, why can't I know the date of my observation visit? I know, you know, it's stressful. You kind of want to be able to be prepared. But one of the reasons that we do that is we just want to protect the credibility and integrity of the accreditation process. So if we let you know your day, um, then it might be you're performing on your best behavior. And so we're not seeing a normal day um, or a natural day for you to be going through. Not knowing the day also puts everyone on, on an even playing field. Um, so we can ensure we're judging everyone in the same way. Um, and that helps us see that you meet the standards every day and not just on the day the observer comes if you don't know that day. Are there any questions on that? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. After NAFCC has assigned your observer, um, we mail your, uh, sorry, we mail your observer a packet um, and we also will mail you a packet the month before your visit takes place. Um, so if we schedule your month and you don't immediately see your packet arrive in the mail, um, don't worry about it. It'll usually get to you about the second or third week um of the month previous prior to your visit date so for example if your visit is scheduled in december um, you should have that packet in hand by the third week of november and if not you can always give us a call and we can see if um, we may have sent it got lost in mail anything like that um, so your observation packet will include the following it has the self-certified standards for nafcc accreditation the parent surveys the provider's evaluation of the, of the observer, and then the conflict of interest affidavit. <clears throat> um, we'll go over each of these pieces next so you know what they're all for. So this is the biggest piece that will come, um, a piece of the packet that you'll fill out. So it's the provider self-certification packet. Um, you'll complete this packet as soon as you receive it, or you can start working on it as soon as you receive it. Um, you'll go ahead and fill out this first page so we can verify your address and everything. Um, and then you'll want to take a look at the instructions on the second page um, to be able to fill this out. So I won't read all of these instructions right now, but just be sure that you do read all of the paperwork that you receive from us thoroughly so that um, we get everything filled out correctly and there aren't delays in your scoring process. Um, so the biggest thing is that you will go through the packet, you'll read each of the standards, um, you'll, you'll score yourself on it, and then if there are lines next to the standard, you'll need to write how you do meet the standard. Um, so we'll go into an example. So this is the first page, and so P1 asks you if you have a working telephone. This one is an easy one, it's, a, it's just a yes or no response, so you'll just check the box accordingly. But then if you look down um, at the one at the bottom, P3, um, this one asks if you support children in their growing self-awareness and self-acceptance. So this standard, you on this standard, you'll mark whether or not you meet it, and then you will write the description as to why, because there's lines next to it. So if there's ever lines next to it, then you do need to give the description. And if the lines are left blank, then the scoring specialist will reach out to you and have you redo whatever pieces of the packet might be blank. Um, so be sure to write a detailed description everywhere lines are provided, um, unless it's something that's not applicable. So um, some of these, for example, in P3, not applicable is not an option. Um, that would only be if you know, there's standards uh, regarding infants or anything like that, and you don't have an infant in your program. Um, this packet will go through all of the standards, so please um, take your time to be sure to read through and fill it out thoroughly so our scores can get the best picture um, from your perspective of your program. Okay. The next piece are the parent surveys. So as soon as you get your packet, you'll want to distribute these to your parents um, so that they can complete them before the day of your visit if possible. 
Um, they are very important, so please make sure that each parent in your program, so a parent from each family that attends your program fills one, one out and returns it either to you or directly to NASCC. Um, we do put our address information on there if they want to send it directly to us. Um, and if you ever need additional copies, we can, um, we're happy to email you the document um, so that you can print as many as you need or send it over to parents as you need. So this is just um, going through the parent survey. Uh, this is what it will look like. So they'll go through and score you in these different areas. Um, and they'll just put the yes or no and then add their comments as, as um, we see at the bottom here. So these surveys really just help our scoring team see the parent's point of view. So we're getting your perspective, the observer's perspective, and also the parent's perspective. So we can make sure we're getting that holistic view of your program um, and ensure there's consistency between your own evaluation and the observer's about evaluation. Um, and then, like I said, we do give them that option to mail it directly to us, or um, you can send it uh, with your packet when you send it back to us. Um, and like I mentioned before, we do want each of the families in your care to complete this. And we're going to base it on the enrollment that you sent us with your application. So if your enrollment has changed since submitting your application, be sure to send us the updated enrollment so we know which families we should have surveys for. Okay, before I jump into the next one, um, are there any questions at this point about parent surveys or the self-certification packet? Those are the hardest pieces for sure, so. All right, I'm not seeing anything come in, but if questions come up, please feel free to ask and I'll um, jump into them as, as we go. So the next form in your packet is the provider's evaluation of the NAFCC observer. So um, you obviously won't be able to fill this out until you've had your visit. And this evaluation won't reflect on your accreditation status in any way. Um, it just helps us make sure our observers are doing a good job. And if any um, changes need to be made, um, this is how we know. So we really appreciate you filling them out and it is required for you to turn them in for us to be able to complete your process. Um, so just make sure to fill it out entirely. It's pretty straightforward. And it's just, I think the one or two pages. Okay, and then the final form that you'll get in your packet is the NAFCC Accreditation Conflict of Interest Affidavit. So before we assign your observer, we do check with them to make sure there's not a relationship um or a personal relationship however if you we do want your confirmation as well um and so just make sure to fill this out as soon as your observation visit is complete someone's asking what if we score ourselves not fully met what percentage do we need to pass um off the top of my head i actually am not sure right now uh it is between 80 and 95 percent and it it does depend on the section and so um i would do the general that i give everyone is obviously do as many as you pop make sure you're doing as much as you possibly can um and be in the 90 to 100 percent range of the standards that you're completing um and remember that the start standards they are required and those other ones um, are the ones where you can miss a few or mark as partially met, and um, you can still be awarded accreditation at that point. Um, let me know if that doesn't answer your question and I can um, go into it a little bit more. The next question I got is, will you be able to see the parents' evaluation? That's up to the parents. We do send you envelopes um, so that they can either mail it back to us or give it to you without you seeing it. Um, we prefer, we give it to them and um, prefer that it's it's blind so you don't see them, um, but it's, it's truly up to the parent. If they hand it to you, um, you can read them. But if they are in the sealed envelope, I wouldn't open them. I would just send them in with your packet. Um, 
And then let's see. Okay. Um, it looks like I don't have any other questions at this point. Um, Suzanne did comment that um, she's thinking it's 90% unless it's a start standard. That does sound correct, and I want to err on the side of 90%. Um, but if you have any specific questions or, or concerns about that, if there's you know several standards you're afraid you won't meet, you can always reach out to us and we'll we'll give you more details. All right. Um, the next, oops. Okay, jumping into the next slide. Um, this is just a tip. You, um, if you're interested in seeing the sample observer workbook, you can access it on our website. Um, it's it will just show you what the observer is seeing and are going through in the packet that they're filling out. Um, they're filling out, they're scoring you on the same standards, but they're kind of in a different order so that they can more easily go through your observation visit and see everything. Um, so if you ever want to see that, it is linked on our website. Okay, so we are about a little more than halfway. So are there any questions regarding the observation visit at this point? I know we did just jump into a few. But if anything else has come up, I'm happy to help. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, I, one has popped in. Um, you asked how long is the visit? Um, they should be there. It's usually four to five hours um, is the amount of time that it should be. So they come um, and they do probably more than half of the observation. And then they're supposed to take an hour lunch to give you a break and to give themselves a break. And then they go back through the packet um, and see uh, what they might need clarification on. And then when they come back, they'll do that interview with you. Um, so about four to five hours is how long it will be. And we'll get into more of those details. Um, so some more things to note before your observer comes. As I mentioned previously, if you've had any changes to your program, um, such as your program start and end time or arrival times, or the children enrolled in your program, please be sure to let us know by either calling or emailing us um, so we can then uh, notify your observer. Um, and then moving on to the next slide about before the observation visit. Um, make sure your house number is clearly displayed or if there's any, you know, if that's a concern of yours, if there's a definitive way that we can make sure we will find your home, please be sure to let us know. Um, there's a place on your application where um, you can uh, fill in that information. Um, you might wanna think about where the observer might sit. Obviously they'll work with any situation, um, but they're kind of trying to stand back and just be a fly on the wall to watch your visit. Um, so you might think about where they might be, where might be a good place for you to direct them. Um, it's also a good idea to make arrangements for someone to help you watch the children while you're doing that interview that I was talking about. If you don't already have an assistant, <clears throat> or someone that works with you um, that might be able to help during the interview. So a lot of providers ask us how they can make arrangements when they don't know the day of the visit. Um, and we just recommend having one of your substitutes on call that knows that your visit is taking place during the specific month um, so that they'll be available for that interview. But if you can't find the substitute, if someone's not there, we'll usually, we'll be able to work around and we can usually do it during nap time or something like that where um, you'll be able to answer the observer's questions with fewer interruptions. Okay, and then I have a few questions. Okay. Um, Someone is asking, what if all ages are not represented on the day of the assessment? Um, we try to get as many, we try to visit with as many of your children there as possible with the eight, as many age ranges as possible. Um, but our minimum requirement is just that you have at least three children there. 
Um, so we, it is usually up to you, um, but as long as we can observe a lot of the standards, we can move forward with the visit. Um, it's only if there's fewer than three children or if, it, if um, what's happening in your program won't reflect a typical day where um, we might have to reschedule your visit. The next question is, is the one hour interview within those four to five hours? Yeah, that, that is included in that amount of time. And just so you know, it's that range is, um, sometimes it depends upon the observer and if they've been able to observe all that they need to, sometimes it will take, you know, the longer amount of time um, if they're, if it's more difficult for them to observe standards. So sometimes it's actually easier to observe more standards when there's more children. Um, so it's possible your visit might take a little longer when there's fewer, but you never know. It just kind of depends on um, the observer and how they work the situation. Um, the next question I have is, her child care program is in a large room and is asking if the observer will sit and watch or follow you around. So um, probably both, it will be a mixture. So she has to observe or the observer has to observe just as much as they possibly can. Um, so it will involve both of those things. So a lot of sitting back and just watching your interactions. Um, but you know, as you're preparing lunch or if she's looking for things like the fire extinguisher and carbon monoxide detectors, things like that, she'll be doing some walking around as well. Um, so they're trained to try to be, you know, kind of stepping back as much as possible and not making, you know, a big, a big impact on how your program runs at all. Um, but there will be both of those things. And then someone's asking if they don't always have more than three children, that might be a problem. It may. Um, when we are scheduling your observation visit, we'll usually ask these questions. So um, if you have pretty low enrollment, if you only have three children enrolled, we might be able to see everything that we need to with just two children there for the observation visit. Um, but if you have, for example, 10 children enrolled and we're seeing only two children there, we're afraid that might not give us a typical day. And so we might not go forward with it. Um, but like I said, when you submit your application um, and when we're scheduling the observation visit, we can always talk through those details just to see what might work best. Um, the next question I have is, what if most of your children are in the evening? Um, we can make those arrangements as well. So we just need to be able to see a pickup and drop off. It doesn't have to be or a pickup or a drop off. Um, it doesn't have to be just in the morning. Um, we just need to be able to see that parent interaction at some point. All right, those are all the questions I see for now. So I'll go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so talking a little bit more about um, the observation visit. Uh, you may want to inform your parents that it's your visit month and then check on their plans for regular attendance. Um, if they have any vacations or variations, um, we take to come and then, um, as we've talked about, have too few enrolled to be able to see a lot of the standards. And then, um, as we mentioned, it's best for the observer to see the typical day with a lot of the children present. Um, including the youngest, we try to have that. But as we talked about previously, if that's not possible or doesn't happen, um, as long as there are enough children for us to see a typical day or a mostly typical day, that's what we need. Okay, um, so a little bit more, we've already talked about um, a lot of this, but why do we need to have three or more children? So you'll actually have a, a greater chance of scoring higher in the relationship section if there's more children present for us to see your relationship with. So um, there, that's where you'll have more opportunities to show off your talents and abilities and the, the efforts that you've made to work on those quality standards that have to do with relationships because that is such a big piece um, of our standards here at NAFCC. Um, and then 
If you know that you won't have the three or more children on a particular day, please be sure to call us um, and then we'll let your observer know that it isn't a good day. If you know your visit month already um, and anything last minute comes up to like an appointment or something like that, um, then please just let us know so that we can make sure your observer won't go out when you are closed. Um, let me see. Okay. I don't have any additional questions at this point, so I'll just keep going. Um, you don't need to be like this woman on the slide, don't worry. Um, we will go into some of our tips about how you can prepare for, or we have gone through the tips for the observation visit, so now you're just, you're watching and waiting, um, and you might be a little bit nervous. So let's talk about what actually happens when the observer arrives. Um, but just remember, you have done the hard work of making your program great um, and submitting the application, all that documentation. And so we, um, you know, be confident that it will be successful. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more. We've gotten into some of these with the questions again, but we'll talk more about the flow of the observation visit. So when the observer arrives, just remember to breathe. Like I was saying, you've already done the preparation. It's just, um, it's just now you're just showing off all of the, the work that you've done. Um, so NAFCC wants you to exceed. The observer wants you to, ex to succeed. Um, we are not, we're not at all trying to tear you down. So just try to have as normal a day as you can. Um, you can start by introducing the observer to the children and telling them their ages, which is important. Um, and then if a parent happens to be there when the observer arrives, you can introduce them as well. But do know the observer is supposed to keep conversation to a minimum um, so that they can kind of be in the background. So they will um, probably be pretty brief with the parents. And then if you do have time, you can give them the brief tour of your home. Um, show them where they can view your records and everything. And then you can also take these first few moments um, to make your call to your substitute or your backup person to let them know you might need help um, with your interview later. Okay, after you've met and done your pleasantries, the observation will start. So as we talked about, the observation will last four to five hours. The observer will just be there to step back, be a fly on the wall, watch your program as it normally runs. Um, they will look through your records and just know that they will keep the visit confidential um, and know that they will not offer um, any mentorship or advice. So don't be asking them questions during the visit. Um, just proceed as normal as if they're not there. Um, they're not going to give you feedback. Um, they are not gonna play or interact with the children and then they won't be eating lunch with you or the children because that's the time where you get a break to step back and they get a break to kind of review what they've seen so far. Okay, um, during the four to five hours, the observer will score and document each standards with one of the following um, statuses listed on this diagram. So they'll mark a standard as being fully, partially, or not met. And then they'll mark NA for any standards that are not applicable, such as standards like we talked about before that relate to assistance or infants, and you may not have assistance or infants in your program. Um, they will mark standards that apply, but they but are not seen as NO, and that means for not observed. And they'll ask you about those standards during your interview. And then I have a few questions. Someone asked if you fail your observation, do you get an opportunity to redo? So if that happens, you can, we do give you the opportunity to submit an appeal. Um, and that goes through each of the standards that you may have gotten marked as not fully met or not met, where you go through and you can show how you do meet them. Um, however, if you choose to not do the appeal, you will be deferred, which means for a year, um, you need to wait a year before applying for accreditation again. And the purpose of that year is to give you more time to go through self-study, go through the benchmarks, and make sure you're ready. The next question I have is, what if the observer doesn't stay for the entire four hours? That's okay. 
Um, sometimes, like I mentioned, they may be they may be able to see the interactions that they need to and be able to see things really efficiently. So if it's less than that, um, then that's okay. And someone's asking, will the observer give us feedback with our final result? They will not. So as we talked about earlier, um, the next step is the scoring piece. So the observer records all the information, then they send it over to us. We get your parent surveys and your self-evaluation. And then we have scoring specialists who they're experts in the field. They'll go through and assess all of that information. And then they are the ones that will give you your score. Um, let me see. And someone asked, if you're deferred, will you have to pay the application fee again? You do have to pay the fee again. Um, it is like starting over in the process because we do have to process all your documentation again and send a new observer and everything like that. Um, but as we're talking about, if you've spent sufficient time in self-study, um, and especially, you know, it's nice if you have been utilizing the Facebook group for candidates. If you have coaches or anything, that's also a huge advantage so that you can make sure that you are ready before you apply um, so that you'll be able to, to meet those standards and be awarded accreditation. Okay, so like we talked about, and as this cute little kitten demonstrates, sometimes we need a break, right? So after about the three or four hour mark, um, the observer will take a break to prepare for the interview. And this will give you a break as well where you can eat lunch and kind of have a moment where the observer isn't um, walking around your program or observing at that time. And then um, we ask you to not ask the observer to skip the break. Um, they need to be able to go through their documentation before they do the interview, and it may put you at a disadvantage if they're to skip their lunch and just keep charging through. Someone asked um, another question regarding the appeal process. So that's if you um, were to miss too many standards on your observation visit. Um, how long does the appeal process take? I would say a couple months. Um, we give you 30 days to submit the appeal, and then within 30 days, you'll receive an answer from us. And that goes to, they are called the Accreditation Commission, and they're experts in the field as well, and they'll um, observe or go through your information objectively and just review everything. And then, let's see. A few other questions on how many you're allowed to miss. So as we were talking about before, it's actually a percentage, um, and it depends on the section. Um, they, we were talking about at least 90% make sure that you're meeting that. Um, and if you have any concerns about that, please just reach out to us before your visit so that we can verify. Um, we don't want you to go into your visit thinking that you have several standards that you can miss when it would be a disadvantage for you. And then someone was asking what forms they're looking for in the child's record. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, um, but I know they're looking at enrollment and just making sure um, some of your documentation is updated. Um, if you are concerned about that, like I said, you can send us an email and I can give you more details maybe after this. Um, the next question I have is if they do, they're doing part-time care and are concerned that they don't have many children. Um, let's see what happens. Can you clarify, Regina, I'm reading your question. You're asking what happens if in the time I submit my application, you hire a teacher. Um, can you clarify what you mean by that? And I'll just speak generally, to submit your application, you do have to have three children enrolled. I'll move on to the next question. Um, do you have to complete a, I'm not sure if that's a typo, <laughs> portfolio. Kamisha, can you clarify that for me?
I'm not sure. She's asking about completing a BAS portfolio. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that means, so I'm thinking not. Um, but like I said, please send me an email after, um, and we can. I can clarify that with you. Okay. Don't have any other questions at this point. Um, I will go ahead and move forward. Oh, someone commented that it's a stars to quality rating requirement. Um, I don't, you wouldn't need to complete that for any FCC's purposes. Um, it would just, it sounds like it's just for your QRS. Okay, moving forward after the break, we'll just talk about how the interview goes. So the interview is comprised of two components. So you have the scripted questions and then the provider responses. So the, the observer will ask you 15 scripted questions and record your responses. And then for any standard scored partially met, not met, or not observed, you'll have a chance to discuss how you feel you do meet those standards. And then um, as we have here, the interview should be no longer than an hour and a half. Okay, so a few tips for success during the interview. Um, remember to relax and answer your questions um, honestly and be excited to talk about your program. So this gives you a chance to kind of talk informally about your program. Um, and then do remember that um, keep your answers, not necessarily, they don't have to be short, but concise or uh, to the point to make sure you're getting the point across that you want to. Um, and then our observers will record that down. And then during your responses to the standards, um, make sure you're not making excuses for why something didn't happen, but maybe talk about how you regularly meet the standards. So if they bring up a standard they're concerned about, um, all we want to hear is just how you actually do meet that standard. So specific examples of, oh, hey, I actually meet that in this way by doing this. Okay, I have a few questions that have popped up. Someone's asking um, if they submit their application and they're waiting to be observed, if they hire someone um, or if their, their staff has a change, do you report it with NAFCC? Um, yes, we do want to know those changes. So along with any changes in your program enrollment or starting times, things like that, we do wanna know if your staff has changed. So if there's been assistant changes or even people living in the home, just so our observer knows what to expect and what they will be observing. The next question I have um, is, will the provider receive a packet when it's time to be reaccredited? You won't. Um, we, will, we try to send reminders, but we do send those as a courtesy and don't guarantee that they um, will always get to you. Um, sometimes they can even go to spam in your email and things like that. So we always recommend that you keep your copy of your um, accreditation letter and your certificate somewhere you can easily see them or find them because those will have the dates on them where we recommend submitting your application and it will have your end dates and everything for you to know when you need to submit by. Um, and then we do have the application information online that you can either print out or you can do the online application. Okay. On this next slide, um, after the interview is over, your observation is complete, so you survived. Um, remember to fill out the final pages of your provider packet, so finish up your self-certification, and then we want you to send it back to us within 48 hours of the visit so that we can move forward with getting you scored. Um, and then remember that that includes your um, evaluation of the observer and then the conflict of interest. And then, um, you'll include the parent surveys that you have received back, and if there's any that you haven't, please encourage your parents to get those submitted and mailed over to us. And then I have a question. What if my evaluation of the observer is not favorable towards them? Um, as we mentioned previously, what whatever you put on your 
your observer evaluation, we don't, we won't hold it against you. Um, and it is just, it's great for us to know how things are going for our observers. Um, and that's what we'll use it for. If um if in your observation there's any glaring concerns or anything like that um we and we didn't get enough information to award your accreditation then we could talk about it at that point but it usually um it doesn't affect your accreditation and usually we're able to even if you had kind of a maybe a not as positive experience with the observer um, usually we'll be able to to look past that and see in what they scored if your program is of the quality that we want which is is really the point of the visit so but i'm hoping i you know that will hopefully not be your experience our observers have been um, gone through the extensive training and and going through you know, reviews of their training so that you'll have a positive experience. Okay, so on to the exciting part. So once we receive your packet and the observer's packet, um, your scoring process will begin. So you've done everything, we have all the information, and we send, um, as we've mentioned, this goes to the scoring specialist and they will compile everything and let you know your score um, usually within four to six weeks is our timeline right now um, and they will email you immediately upon um, scoring you and then we will send you your accreditation certificate the physical certificate in the mail someone's asking um you briefly met an observer at a training, but don't know her personally. Uh, she lives within a few hours of you and your observation month is this month. If she's my observer, is that okay since I've met her? Um, yes, so when it comes, like I said, uh, we check with observers first to make sure there's no conflict of interest. And if there is a conflict of interest, they tell us and we find someone else. Um, but if it happens to be that person who is going to come out to you and visit, um, the point is that they're able to be objective. So if you just briefly met them, if there's really no relationship um, and there wasn't like that sustained interaction, then I'm not, we're not worried about them being able to be objective. Um, and that's okay. It's not like you'd fail your observation or anything because of that. Um, truly, we do, we vet that on our end of things and are just confirming with you to make sure that's okay. Um, and like I said, the point is we just want to make sure they can be as objective as possible. So just a brief interaction with them, I'm not really concerned about. And then someone's asking about a portfolio. You do have certain documents. so. This is in the benchmarks as well, um, but you have certain documents you do need to compile. It is, you don't have to put them in a specific way, um, but some providers do kind of keep them in a portfolio-like um, organization. So um, we do have to, like I said, go through some of the documentation, um, but it's up to you how you kind of present that. And then your benchmarks does have more information on everything that we need to have you compiled. And then someone's asking, can we request an observer to be bilingual? Um, yes, so on your application, there is a spot on the first page where you can put, um, I think it's, I can't remember exactly the wording, but it's, I need my observer to be bilingual or something like that. And we do have bilingual observers that can go out. The next question, um, she was asking, we won't know if we receive a passing score four to six weeks later, or is that the time to wait for the mailed certificate? So the four to six weeks at this point is, that's how long it might take for you to know. Um, we're trying to go no longer than that, and I, it should hopefully be faster than that. Um, but that is the time that, just with everything that's in their queue, because our scoring specialists are not full-time employees with us. Um, they 
that's kind of how how far behind they work. So um, once you know is the the four to six weeks is when you actually know if you passed. Okay, I'm just looking through a few other questions here. Someone's asking, what if they have a doctor's appointment and the, and the observer comes that day? So that is like I mentioned previously, if you know you have a doctor's appointment, um, as soon as you know that, or as soon as you know your program might be closed, and it's on a, a day that you didn't tell us previously was an exclusion day, um, please call our office and we will just make sure to pass the word to the observer so that they don't go out and miss it um, or and miss you. If we do go out and it was something that, um, you know, was foreseeable and we could have uh, known about it, then we may have to do a reschedule and there is a fee to reschedule your observation visit. And then um, another question, does the observer review the self-study workbook that you're working on right now? Um, they don't go through your benchmarks book as far as I'm aware. Um, they are just going through, like I said, they're going through the standards um, on their packet that, uh, that we have sent to them. So kind of in a different order, but it is, it's all the same things that you have done going through self-study and in the benchmarks. The next question I have is, do we need to have any degree um, to be accredited? So no, um, the, advantage is, the advantage of having a degree is that you can always count any, um, a completed degree towards your accreditation training hours. So in some of our other, um, in our other webinars, we go through that in more depth. So I will only just touch on it, but if you have a related degree, so early childhood or child development, um, that will count for a certain percentage of your training hours. And then um, if it's an unrelated bachelor's or master's degree, you can still get um, some hours for that. Unfortunately, the unrelated associates doesn't count, um, but if you do have even a related associates, then we can use that for hours every time that you, re you accredit and re-accredit. Okay, so as we, we've talked about before, um, there's two decisions that can be made during the scoring process. So um, either accreditation or deferral. So accreditation is where the standards are met, um, including the start standards. And then if not enough standards were met, then we would defer you for the period of one year where you can either, you can submit your appeal within 30 days or during that year, you can spend that time working on your self-study um, and working on your program so that you can be ready to apply after the next year. Okay, so as soon as the decision is made, like we talked about, our scoring team's going to email you your electronic reward, and then shortly thereafter, we do send them out every week, you'll get your, um, your physical award in the mail. Um, and you're done. It, you've done the whole process and you can feel great about everything you've accomplished. It really is. It's a great accomplishment. It's so much work that you have put in. Um, and this observation visit, like I said, this is where you get to, to show all that hard work off that you've done. So um, even though it, it can be nerve wracking, um, I think it's really, it's the most exciting step um, because you get to to really show you know us and your communities um, all that work that you have done for those children in your program all right we have reached the end of our webinar um, so if there are any other questions i can um, answer those i'll give you a few moments to send them my way but um, we really appreciate you coming tonight and um, if you have any other questions that you don't think of right now, I'm not seeing anything come through, um, then you can always uh, shoot us over an email or give our office a call. Someone ask, is asking from start to finish, how long does it take? Um, that depends a lot on you. So if, 
a lot of providers, it depends on where their program's at when they begin self-study, but I'd say between six months to a year in the self-study process um, is pretty standard. And then once we receive your application, it can be about three more months. And then um, from there, another month or two to receive the final score. Um, so it's quite the process um, from receiving your application to having your score in hand, like I said, can be about four to five months. And then additionally, the time and self-study kind of depends on you. And someone's asking, how often are providers deferred? Um, fairly infrequently. Because of the way the self-study process is and because it's so involved, um, we really are trying to set you up for that success so that you're evaluating yourself um, and making those improvements as you go before we even come and see your program. So um, it's, it's fairly infrequent. And I'll just head to this next slide. If you have any other questions, I can stay on for a few more moments, um, but I did want to go to this next slide. So um, I wanted to mention the Facebook groups. We have the, you can search these groups in Facebook and request to join. We have NAFCC accreditation candidates in process. So that's anyone who is in the self-study process right now and is working towards that first observation visit, that first um, accreditation. We also have NAFCC accredited providers. So that's for those of you who have already been accredited and are currently accredited. Um, and then we have our group for NAFCC observers. That's for um, anyone that's a current observer with us and a group for accreditation facilitation projects um, it, that are like coaches in your area and everything like that. Um, but I would encourage you to join the accreditation candidates in process if you haven't already or NAFCC accredited providers if you are currently accredited. Um, those are a great place where you can collaborate with each other and talk about um, the many right ways that there are to meet these standards. Um, I do have a f another question. Oh, she's asking if there's a copy of this recording that will be available. Um, it will, we will post it. Uh, we have it on our NAFCC YouTube channel. Um, it will be posted when it's available. Um, and it is also posted in the eSelf study. Um, if you have any questions about accessing either of those places, you can give our office a call um, or send us an email and we can link you to it. I'm not seeing any other questions. So thank you so much for attending. Um, we're super excited to have so many people on these webinars and um, we want you to be successful in the accreditation process. So if any other questions come up, like I said, um, reach out to our team and we'll be happy to help you.